uh, it's no trouble at all. Um, so thank you so very much uh, for this, uh, Whitney. Uh, it's been, I, I was checking my emails and I last spoke, I first spoke to you a decade ago. I sent you a long email. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's an absolute honor uh, for me uh, to have this opportunity to host you at MIT. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I want to start off by just thanking Francis uh, Borrego. Uh, thank you so much for helping arrange this and uh, for coordinating uh, a lot of what's going on right now. Um, I also wanted to thank Telis Bertsekas. Uh, he, he's the head of the MBA, fi MBA Finance Certificate Lecturer and, uh, and is the champion really behind the Brass Red Investments Fund. Uh, Telis has been incredibly kind in supporting me in, in my quest to interview some of the most well-known value-focused investors in the world. And uh, Telis, thank you uh, for allowing me this wonderful opportunity. Uh, the Brass Rat Investments Fund is a nonprofit long short equity fund that is run by undergraduate and graduate students at MIT following the completion of an educational program. The fund itself provides a hands on learning experience on how to look for and invest in companies, both long and short, uh, and goes in line with MIT's motto of uh, mind and hand. I also wanted to draw attention to Emily Warren and Kavi Kalator. Uh, who've been leading the student focus within the Brass Rats Fund and to the amazing undergraduate and graduate students participating in this fund. Uh, thanks also to the Investment Management Club, the VCPE Club, and the e ETA Club for supporting us and for helping us get the word. I'm just going to... Uh, it's on voice isolation, so it should be better. Um, now it is my distinct honor to introduce Whitney uh, Tilson. Whitney is the founder and CEO of Empire Financial Research, which focuses on providing advice, commentary, and in-depth research and analysis to help people around the world uh, to become better investors. Prior to launching Empire, he founded and ran Case Learning, to which he taught a range of investing seminars around the world and hosted two conferences dedicated to short selling. He has also founded Case Capital Management, which managed three value-oriented hedge funds and two mutual funds. Uh, Whitney has done an incredible amount of work around the world of value investing and even in the focused on the personal world, uh, including writing a number of books uh, such as The Art of Value Investing, uh, The Art of Playing Defense, and How to Get Ahead by Not Falling Behind, and, and has contributed to one of the most uh, famous value-focused books and on Charlie Munger, uh, you know, Poor, Poor Charlie's Almanac. So my introduction to Whitney came about a decade ago. Uh, when I came across his website, tilsonfunds.com. On this website, Whitney has done an insane amount of work uh, collecting resources specific to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. And it is really this website that taught me a lot about what I know of these two giants of the investing world. Uh, for what many don't know is that uh, when Alice Schroeder was writing her book on Buffett, Buffett actually pointed uh, Alice to Whitney for the full set of uh, his partnership letters uh, dating to 1957. Furthermore, Charlie's Munger, uh, Charlie Munger's talk on the psychology of human misjudgment, which is a very popular uh, talk uh, in the investing world, uh, was first recorded and transcribed by Whitney. So we owe a lot to a lot of the work that he has done. Uh, there's much more to Whitney than what I cover here. Uh, for example, if you read David Einhorn's book, uh, Fooling Some of the People All of the Time, you'll see Whitney's name mentioned. Uh, Whitney also sits on the board of the Pershing Square Foundation. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's uh, friends with Bill Ackman and they went to HBS, I think a couple of years apart, but good friends. So in terms of the structure of this call, we'll follow with a short presentation from Whitney uh, talking about his investing career and how he pivoted and learned along the way. We'll then open up the call to a Q&A session. So please feel free to raise your hands and we will uh, put the attention on you or you can use the Q&A functionality, but we want this to be a little bit more interactive. So please, you know, uh, speak up and ask up. Uh, Winnie, thank you so much for your time uh, and uh, over to you to kick this All off. All right. My pleasure. Thanks for the kind introduction. And, uh, um, you know, I learned at the feet of um, uh, older investors when I, I was you, you all's age. And so I try and uh, give back. I don't think I've ever turned down a, an invitation to speak to students because uh, um, I know how important it is. This is a, investing is an experienced based business. There are only two ways to get that experience. One is you go out there and stumble around and make mistakes and lose money. Or the other way, the much better way is to learn from somebody who's been doing it for a while, which is true not only of investing, but 
you know, any any high skill profession, uh, almost any high skill profession I can think of, ranging from you know being a good surgeon to a you know good fighter pilot uh, or a Navy SEAL. So um, so I'll uh, what I want to do is just whip through a presentation here I gave about a year ago, but it's timeless just on some of the um, uh, what I've learned over the years uh, about investing, and then happy to take questions about anything you want. Um, so let me give you a little background. I'm um, uh, I trust you can see here. So um, here are uh, three of the books that uh, you just mentioned um, uh, that I'm sort of the co-author of. Um, and then I've actually written a fourth book um, that's not related to investing, which you also mentioned called The Art of Playing Defense, which I'll send you a PDF of this one. You can buy it on Amazon. It's on Audible, but happy to send you a copy that was uh, a book I wrote for my daughters was sort of my life advice is not an investing book after writing three or co-authoring three investing books. Um, I've been to the last, I think it's now 22. I think this slide is old. I think I've been to the last like 26 Berkshire annual meetings. Uh, so uh, that's where I learned to invest um, is at the feet of uh, Graham, Dodd, Buffett and Munger. So um, the 18 years I ran a hedge fund from 1999 through 2017, um, I was um, sort of old school value investor. And what that meant was at the time uh, was I bought cheap stocks. So I was looking for stocks trading at low multiple of sales, earnings, book value, um, typically companies that were performing poorly that had caused their stocks to sell off. Um, and of course, I was smart enough to appreciate that higher quality businesses uh, were all other things being equal were important. But the first screen was statistical cheapness of uh, on a valuation basis. So um, looking back, uh, I made uh, four what I call the classic mistakes that value investors tend to make. Uh, number one, I invested in low quality businesses um, and many of their stocks turned into value traps because the business's fundamentals continued to decline. Number two, um, I sat there and looked at high quality businesses and didn't buy them because you know they were trading at 15 or 20 times earnings and I wanted to pay 10 times earnings or something like that. Um, number three, to the extent that they ever did really sell off, and I own some of the greatest businesses of all time. I owned Apple at 35 cents. I owned Amazon at 240. I owned Home Depot at $10. I owned McDonald's at $10. The list goes on and on. Um, and I owned them and they went up a bit. And um, and I sold them because they didn't look cheap anymore. Um, and I failed to hold on to some of the greatest compounders of all time. Um and lastly, I failed to understand and appreciate powerful new technologies and trends. Um, so is uh, what I have discovered you know, later in life uh, is that what really matters uh, to successful investing is uh, the quality of the business and how it performs over time. Not exclusively, but I'd say 75% of what matters um, in terms of what a stock does over an extended period of time. Uh, is how well the underlying uh, company performs. And only 25% doesn't matter how cheap, uh, how clever you were at buying it at a cheap price. And so for my entire career, I had it backwards. I looked among cheap stocks and tried to find somewhat better businesses that you know, weren't value traps. And what I should have done is, is focused all my attention on the 100 greatest companies in the world and then tried to be somewhat valuation sensitive, uh, but just own the greatest businesses, um, even if it meant paying up somewhat. So it was a terrible, terrible mistake that I didn't learn this till till too late in my career. Um, and by the way, over 18 years, I matched the S&P 500, roughly speaking, but it was vast outperformance in the first 12 years um, of beating the market 11 out of 12 years. Uh, this was from 1999 through the global financial crisis and, and the immediate year or two afterward. Um, and, you know, I tripled my investors' money in a flat S&P 500. And then the last five years, uh, I was up 16%. The market was up 96%. So I just chronically trailed a bull market. Uh, I'll talk about that later. But, you know, overall, I did fine. I didn't blow up. Uh, when I say this was a terrible mistake, it wasn't like I disgraced myself. Um, but uh, I should have done much, much, much better than I did. So I'm hoping to impart a little bit of wisdom to you all early in your career. So you don't take 17 years to figure this out. Uh, so is the answer here? I just buy the best companies irrespective of, the of you know, where their stock is. And of course, that's not the case either because growth investors also make four big mistakes. One, 
they overestimate future growth and forget the powerful forces of reversion to the mean, uh, driven by technological changes, new competitors, size is an anchor to growth, trees don't grow to the sky. Number two, they pay too high a price, such that even if the business performs well, the stock doesn't. Three, they fall in love with their companies and fail to sell when they should. They fail to identify you know, when a great company ceases to become a great company. Um, and four, they get sucked into sort of story stocks, uh, which were never great companies, but they seem exciting and growthy. So what should you be is, is, and what I try to be today, you know, just managing my personal account and also um, uh, what I recommend to my subscribers and my newsletters is, is I try and combine the best of growth and value. And what I call, what one of my colleagues uh, labeled, uh, I love the phrase is I'm a make money investor. Um, so um, let me go through a few lessons uh, here. Um, number one, stocks tend to follow earnings over long periods of time. So I can show you 20 charts like this. This is Costco, one of the great companies of all time. Um, 56 bagger since 1994. And all these charts, um, you know, I haven't updated since a year ago, but nothing's changed here. Um, you know, look at Google, look at uh, Nike, it's, uh, look at Visa. Look at Home Depot, look at McDonald's, the list goes on and on. Um, so here's Nike. Um, and uh, you know, in the interest of time, I haven't included 10 more slides I could show you. I, I'm giving you a little bit shortened presentation. So number two, though, you have to be aware of extreme overvaluation. An absolutely classic case here um, is Cisco. Back when I started my investing career in 1999, it was the hot stock, had the most, uh, the peak of the internet bubble. They were making all the routers, the backbone for the internet, just as they do today. Uh, great company, but the stock, you know, had gone up a zillion fold, uh, had a 500 plus billion dollar market cap, was trading at 150 times earnings. Um, and uh, this is a little bit of a complex chart, but basically it shows that earnings have quadrupled but the multiple went from 150 to 25. And so 20 years later, you've broken even if you bought at the top, um, you know, you don't wanna do that. So valuation does matter, uh, certainly at the extreme, even if the underlying stock, uh, the earnings grow nicely, if you if you wildly overpay. And there are a whole lot of companies, um, you know, a Shopify and a, a whole bunch of growthy companies, a PayPal, et cetera, um, that are good companies. But two years ago, you know, they got caught up in a bubble. So I'm not talking about the meme stock garbage. I'm talking about real companies with real earnings. But when you pay 40 times revenue for, you know, a good sized company, uh, you're going to get clobbered. You're going to take, you know, those com those stocks are probably buys today, but they're down 80 percent. The people who bought at the top are not going to recover that money for 20 years. So uh, number three, beware of value traps. Again, stocks follow earnings. Look at Bed Bath & Beyond. Um, I've been telling people this was a zero years ago and you know got caught up in the meme stock stupidity and Ryan Cohen manipulated it, an absolute disgrace. Um, but uh, of course it went to zero where it belongs. Um, so look for inflection points. That's really the key to investing. Companies that are pivoting for the better. Uh, so, um, it's uh, if you can correctly identify a great company, but buy their stock at anything but an extreme overvaluation, you're probably going to do well. But if you really want to make you know, multi-bagger kind of returns, you want to buy the stock of great companies when they're out of favor and the valuations get quite reasonable, sometimes even downright cheap. Uh, so if you catch an inflection point, what happens is, is the earnings take off because they were temporarily depressed for some reason. Um, and you get a multiple expansion as well as all the growth investors pile back into it. So, you know, if earnings uh, double or triple and the multiple goes from 10 to 30 times earnings, you've just made five to 10 times your money. That's the dream, right? So uh, an inflection point isn't waiting around for the next March 23rd, 2020, or when some external shock hits the market, or there's a meltdown, you know, good luck sitting on your thumb for five years, you know, that ha tends to happen once or twice a decade. Um, I'm talking about individual stocks, or sometimes a whole industry or sector gets gets puked out, and you can find some some good companies there. So examples, every one of which are most of these, not every one that I hit, but Netflix in 2012, Berkshire Hathaway at the peak of the internet bubble, you know, trading at cash and investments per share. 
uh, McDonald's um, back in the price war with Burger King in 03. Booking Holdings, the old Priceline.com, it's been more than a thousand bagger since 2002. The, uh, after the bursting of the internet bubble, there were some insanely great cheap stocks, Apple, Amazon, but most people don't realize Booking Holdings has been more than, has been probably a 2000, I think it's gone, the stock's gone from one to 2000. Um, Domino's Pizza and the global financial crisis, Microsoft 10 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So catching good companies uh, when either some stock specific stuff or some macro stuff is impacting them. So to, to identify an inflection point, you must have a variant perception. That's a term that Michael Steinhardt, I believe, first used, one of the classic old time hedge fund guys. Um, so an inflection point is when all the other investors think that a company is doomed. It's going to stagnate or decline, but instead turns around and grows. Um, so they're very difficult to identify. You don't really have to be exactly right. It doesn't really matter if you bought booking holdings at $3, $2, or $1, um, right? So it's better to be roughly right than precisely wrong. Um, but you better be clear, what is your variant perception? In fact, anytime you ever buy a stock, you should say to yourself, okay, the thousand, uh, thousand million investors and all the supercomputers in the world are all out there um, scanning through the entire market looking for mispricings. And you think you found one, odds are pretty damn good that they're all right and you're wrong. Um, so be very clear about what your variant perception is, what you think is going to happen that is that is different from what is causing the stock to be depressed. Um, and uh, and then pay close attention and have a lot of humility that it's probably the case nine out of ten times that you, you th that you you have a variant perception. It's easy to have a variant perception. You can have a variant perception on every stock in the universe. Okay, what's hard is is to have a variant perception that is correct because everybody else, the consensus view, the consensus view is pretty darn smart most of the time. You know the the wisdom of crowds, right? Uh, so, so you got to combine uh, a bit of humility, ability to admit your variant perception is not playing out and pull the plug, uh, et cetera. So, um, how do you identify one of these rare, valuable things, a variant perception that is correct? Um, and the answer is, is generally you need some sort of unique piece of data insight or analysis. Like in the case of March 23rd, 2020, you just had to believe the world wasn't coming to an end, that we were going to get sort of COVID. It wasn't going to, you know, keep us, keep every business on earth shut down for another 12 months, you know? Um, and so uh, I did a super in-depth dive into the pandemic, looked what was happening in China, where it had originated. And I figured, you know, things are going to be bad for a while, but we're going to get a handle on this. And the government's going to pour a lot of money into the economy and to save, to save the economy, right? That was my um, you know, sort of out of consensus data insider analysis when everybody else was panicking. Um, so it helps to have a variant perception if you're in your sweet spot, a country, a market, an industry, an individual company in which you have deep knowledge, experience, and relationships. Um, there have been six pound the table buying opportunities for Berkshire Hathaway in the last 25 years. I've nailed all six in size. Um, that's not by accident. Uh, it's because I've been to the last 25 Berkshire annual meetings. I've studied Buffett and Munger. I've written books about them. Um, and I and I follow the stock. I've owned the stock uh, so um, uh, for, for that entire period. Uh, but I've only owned it in real size at one time as much as 30% of my hedge fund uh, back literally the day the NASDAQ peaked on March 10th of 2000 at the peak of the internet bubble. Berkshire hit a multi-year low. Um, and, you know, it popped 50% in the next three months. And I put 30% of my little nascent hedge fund in it um, um, the day, literally the day it bottomed. Um, now, I'd owned it from 60,000 down to 40,000, um, but I, I, I made it a 30% position at $41,600 a share, you know, right at the bottom. So um, be very careful here, though. You, when you think you've got some unique data insight or analysis, in all likelihood, you're st you're still the sucker at the poker table, right? So you it, it can take many, many years, decades even, to develop the kind of expertise that can lead to um, a correct variant perception. So um, here are some examples in my career where I nailed things. Uh, Netflix, uh, I was stupid enough to be short it back in 2010. Um, I had met Reed Hastings because we were both on the board of KIPP Charter Schools. Um, he, he was national. I was on the local board, but we sort of knew each other. 
I was very frustrated. The stock had run against me. Um, I published uh, something, uh, uh, an article. You can look it up. Whitney Tilson, Why We're Short Netflix. You can go back and read it on Seeking Alpha. Um, and I laid out an 18-page, uh, you know, well-articulated short thesis. Two weeks later, or 10 days or two days later, Reed Hastings posted, Whitney Tilson, cover your short, your Netflix short now. You can Google that as well. And lo and behold, the CEO of a public company took the time to, you know, rebut my arguments. And he invited me out to California. And he he said, you know, Whitney Tilson's a great guy. We're on the board of KIPP. Um, and I don't want him to lose a lot of money shorting my stock. So let me tell you why he's wrong to be short my stock. And by the way, hey, come on out to California and let's have lunch. And that's what I did. And I realized, holy cow, I do not want to be short anything Reed Hastings is running. He's that good. And so I covered my short. And then lo and behold, I got really lucky. The stock dropped by 80% during the Quickster debacle. And I loaded up down at the bottom. It was a 70 bagger from 778 a share to $701 a share from October 3rd of 2012 to the peak in 2021, right? Um, you know, and that was because I took the time, I kept an open mind, had a relationship, um, took advantage of it. I had unique insights into Netflix uh, as a result of all this. Um, Berkshire Hathaway, I've already talked about, Lumber Liquidators. Uh, I was the, I was on 60 Minutes um, um, as the guy who took down Lumber Liquidator. Stock went down 90%. I was short it because um, somebody reached, so somebody I didn't even know sent me an email from China saying, you know, as an American guy who, who was running a lumber producer in China, tried to sell the Lumber Liquidators and they wouldn't buy from him because he was 10% higher price than the Chinese makers. He was, this, this American guy was working for a German company. Um, and he looked into it and he's like, oh, well, the Chinese guys are cheating. They're loading up their wood, their laminate flooring with formaldehyde, which is a carcinogen. And there are all sorts of environmental laws that you can't bring that into the US above a certain level of formaldehyde. So he gave me the whole story and I took it 60 minutes and they took the company down. You can Google that too um, and watch the six, 13 minute segment. I had real insight there as to what was really happening in the supply chain for a company that was poisoning American families. In the case of McDonald's, one of my investors was a, a, had a family coffee business that sold McDonald's. Um, when he heard I was long McDonald's back when it was very an, un, a very unpopular stock, Jim Cramer called it unownable on CNBC. Um, this guy put me in touch with a franchisee who told me the new CEO, Jim Cantalupo, is really shaking things up inside the company. Didn't give me any inside information. He was just a franchisee, but gave me insight into what was really happening. A real turnaround was happening there that the market had not picked up on. Uh, same thing with CKE Restaurants, the maker of Carl's Jr. and Hardee's. Um, they introduced these new thick burgers. Um, I ended up visiting the company. The CEO told me about the thick burgers. This was public information. Uh, I called up 40 stores all around the war, uh, all around the country, and I said, "Hey, how are the thick burgers selling? You know, I'm an investor in your company." And the store managers or assistant managers said they're selling like hotcakes. Stock went from three to 18. Um, JetBlue. I wrote articles about the company. People, uh, a friend of mine is a pilot in the company, reached out to me. I developed some relationships. This was back when the company went public 20 years ago. Um, it turns out the stock had just IPO'd as a hot stock, and so I told people. Um, uh, not to buy the stock at the time, but 10 years later, the stock got super cheap. Um, and they had a new CEO coming in who was doing a lot of smart things uh, that I could see were going to increase earnings. Earnings tripled, the stock tripled. And fortunately, I got out because you can't own an airline. You, can, you can't own an airline stock. You can only rent them. Keep that in mind. I, I have owned airline stock since then. I, I think Volaris and Allegiant today are cheap. I own I own a bunch of Spirit Airlines today because I think JetBlue is going to have to buy them, even though they probably wish they didn't have to. There's the U.S. antitrust authorities are in court right now uh, trying to uh, 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 trying to block that merger. I think um, I, I think the judge is going to throw the government's case out and uh, Spirit Airlines at twelve dollars today is going to get bought for thirty two bucks. Um, so th there's there's your hot stock tip of the day. Um, excuse me. So um, lesson number five, I've sort of alluded to this, um, which is let your winners run. Um, it, uh, there, there have been studies out there that show the entire return of the U.S. stock market over any 10, 20, 30, 50 year time period is due to like one or two percent of the stocks. 
This is why index funds beat at virtually all active managers, because the S&P 500 owns Apple at 30 cents a share, owns Amazon at a dollar a share. And you know what? They never got stupid and sold it. OK, they let their index funds, by definition, let their winners run. And in any portfolio, uh, one or two or one or two percent of the stocks are going to be your big winners. But not if you're like and not if you wake up one day a year and say to yourself, oh, you know, I've made three times my money. I don't want to be greedy. Yeah, you do want to be greedy. So um, if you've identified a great company um, and uh, don't tell yourself, oh, if I wouldn't buy it with new cash today, then I shouldn't own it. That is really dumb thinking. If you own a great company and it's kicking ass, hang on to it, except you don't want to let it become 50% of your fund, number one. If it does get to 40 times revenue, take some profits, right? But, uh, you know, uh, so many companies, you if you just sort of hang on and you're willing to stomach some some down uh, some down drafts, you know, look at any look at any Amazon, Apple, Starbucks, uh, Microsoft, any great company. Look at how many 30, 50 percent or more drawdowns they have over a 10 or 20 year period. Um, you cannot get shaken out if it's still if the company's still doing well. Um, you got to hang on to them. I, I know guys, good friends of mine have owned Brown Foreman, maker of Jim Beam Whiskey, one of the great growth companies of all time, have, has owned it since 1983. Uh, another friend of mine owns Berkshire Hathaway A shares that he started buying at $200 in the 1970s. Um, he really loaded up when he started his hedge fund in 1985 at about $1,700. And he still owns all those shares. At, you know, He's 70 years old now. And um, and these guys still own these stocks. You only need one or two of those in a lifetime to be super, super successful. Um, so one way to think about it, by the way, is, and this is really what I should have done with something like Netflix. I made, I, it doubled, I sold half, doubled, sold half, and then doubled again, and I sold it all. And then after I made an average of seven times my money, it went up 10 times. What I should have done, and by the way, they were growing revenue of 40% a year at the time I was selling. Everything was playing out beautifully. They were raising prices. Um, they were developing original content. They were expanding rapidly around the world. Everything was going far better than I had anticipated when Reed Hastings just laid out their nascent streaming plans for me back in 2012, right? 2011. Um, so I should just put a stop loss on it and just let it grow as, you know, if that thing, if you put a 20% trailing stop loss on it, why not let a 5% position become 10, 20, 30, 40, 50% of my hedge fund? I would be, I, I would have uh, at least one, if not two zeros added to my net worth. If instead of just selling out, if I just put a 20% stop loss on it and, and wrote it. So here's Brown Foreman, the one I was talking about. Tom Russo has made 75 times his money since the early 80s, never sold a single share. So a few final thoughts here. Um, in, uh, almost everyone in the market is a speculator. They have absolutely no idea, any concept of, of intrinsic value that they're buying a share of a real company, et cetera. Um, an investor is someone who knows what they own. It's as if they own a private company in its entirety. They have a reasonable estimate of what it's worth, et cetera. 99% of people in the market are just buying something they hope somebody else is gonna buy for them at price. So how do you be an investor? Some tips. Don't ever, ever, ever watch TV, um, CNBC. Um, avoid Twitter and message boards like Value Investors Club, some zero, sometimes some stuff on Seeking Alpha, but 99% of what's out there. FinTalk, I can't think of, uh, no, I can't think of something worse than FinTalk, CNBC. FinTalk's second worst. Um, you should be spending your time uh, just doing a lot of reading and, and as you develop in the business, um, talking to smart people um, and, and going to visit companies, learning about industries, trying to expand your circle of competence and doing deep dives. And don't try and be everything to everybody. It's much more important to do be very deep in a few areas than trying to be broad in 20 different areas um, and try and develop knowledge, experience, relationships so that you'll have an edge and not be the sucker at the poker table and be very clear. All of us who go to elite institutions, I remember what I was like when I was your age and I had a, I had a much bigger ego than I do today. Um, you 
you all think you're super, super smart and you go to MIT and I went to Harvard and I graduated with high honors, Harvard undergrad, graduated with high honors, Harvard Business School, top 5% of my class. Um, I thought I was the shit. And I didn't, in reality, I really didn't know shit. Um, and it's super, super dangerous uh, if you think you're a lot smarter than you are. So it's very ironic to be in the investing business only people with a ton of confidence go into the investing business because you think you're smarter than every supercomputer and every genius on earth, right? That's every time you buy a stock, you think you're smarter than everybody else combined, okay? That is an act of arrogance. But to be successful as an investor, you have to marry that with humility and understanding the crowd is right most of the time. Hey, I don't know shit about cocoa beans. So it doesn't matter that cocoa beans are trading at a 20-year low and look cheap. I should not buy them. Right. Those are those are things like, you know, I, I love Warren Buffett. He's like, my idea of a group decision is looking in a mirror. Right. Like he has a big ego, but he marries it with tremendous humility. And it didn't bother him at all that everybody was going crazy back in the Internet bubble and he didn't own Internet stocks, you know. Uh, so um, trading, try and keep your trading. I mean, look, I actually believe there are some good traders out there and they trade a lot. OK. Odds are extremely low that you are one of them, in which case you should do the exact opposite, which is trade almost not at all. Like I'm talking, you know, I, in my personal account now, I just went eight months without making a single trade, not one trimming a position, nothing. Um, now that I'm not managing other people's money, it's just my own money. Nobody's looking over my shoulder. I feel no pressure. I own... Uh, I own a handful of good companies. And by the way, half my portfolio is in the S&P 500 index fund. Uh, because again, I have the humility to know that, you know, so, so, and then, you know, I own some weird stuff and then some Spirit Airlines comes along and, you know, that looks like a good risk reward. Uh, but I bought it at 16, thinking the deal goes through at 32. It's now at 12 because JetBlue and Spirit just reported crappy earnings. But that's not my investment thesis. Um, by the way, um, I've owned Spirit in the past in my hedge funds. And everybody likes to you know, talk about how shitty Spirit is, but um, I'm telling you, these ultra low cost um, carriers are here to stay. In Europe, they're 50% of the market. In the US, they're 10% of the market, and Spirit's half of that. And the only other two are Allegiant Frontier. Um, and there are plenty of Americans for whom if a, a Spirit's offering a $150 trip and Delta's offering 200, that 50 bucks means a lot to them. I'll pay the extra 50 to fly on Delta, but there, there's a big market for people who are super price sensitive and need to get somewhere. And these ultra low cost carriers, um, you know, I fly them all the time in Europe. Think of, you know, Ryanair has been an incredible stock. So my point is at this point at, at 12 to 16 bucks, you know, I'm down 25% of my investment. I don't care. I don't look at it. My investment thesis hasn't changed. Uh, and, but that was not the case when I was running a hedge fund, you know, sort of stressing me out. And I would have you know, had to write a monthly letter apologizing, you know, something like that is ridiculous. Um, so um, my the, the main point here is, is, uh, is uh, either trade a lot, which I don't recommend, or trade as absolutely infrequently as possible. That is the key to long term investment success. Uh, so and there are loads of studies that that support that, you know, they did a study of, of, of you know, millions and millions, uh, I think, fidelity or somebody gave over the data. They haven't released who it was. It's all anonymous. Of the individual investors, you know, the millions of people who just have their own brokerage accounts at, you know, a Schwab or a Fidelity. <clears throat> and you know the category that did the best? Dead people. Okay. The people who the the, the accounts, you know, the person that died um, and, and, you know, the, the executor or the estate or something uh, or the heirs hadn't gotten around to coming in and closing out the account. Those accounts did best. You know, women did quite a bit better than men. Why? Because women don't suffer from as much overconfidence as men, so they don't trade as much. Uh, so, so all sorts of studies about this. So options um, are just basically all options are is, is just borrowing money. It's just leverage. And now you not only have to be right on the stock, you have to be right on the timing. And it's hard enough, I can tell you, to be right on the stock. Who the heck knows? You know, sometimes stocks will sit there for a long time before they finally work. Um, so, uh, so my suggestion is, is generally don't, don't use options at all. I have had success, um, over the years buying very long dated, like, uh, 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 you have to, you have to be running a hedge fund and get a bank to write it for you, but like a five-year leap call option. 
um, on, uh, you know, when McDonald's was at $12 and I thought it was worth at least 25, I bought a five-year call option, struck at 10 for $4. So the stock just had to move up two bucks over the next five years for me to break even. And then it was a leverage return from there, right? So I've had some luck with that, but by and large, um, as one of my friends just said, um, options are like cocaine. They feel so good, but they will kill you. So um, avoid hot IPOs, duh. Um, look at the SPAC bubble. Um, three most dangerous words in investing. You know, the four most dangerous words are this time is different. The three most dangerous words I would argue are I missed it. So you look at a stock, it's a great company, everything's working out well, and uh, but it's moved up from six to eight dollars or ten to twelve dollars. Uh, or Berkshire Hathaway has gone from two hundred to seventeen hundred dollars, like it did for my friend over ten years. And he still bought the hell out of it, $1,700, because he saw it's a great company and Warren Buffett is that good, right? And, you know, he's made 80 times his money since then or, you know, whatever, right? So um, if if you ever, in the back of your mind, like value investors, I love buying stocks at 52-week lows, even better 10-year lows. <laughs> By the way, one I'm sort of looking at these days is, by, believe it or not, JetBlue 10 years later after I made a quick triple on my money. JetBlue isn't going away. I think it's a good airline. Um, and the stocks, it gone from, uh, you know, I bought it at seven. It went to 21. I think I sold at 21. It peaked at 26. And today it's at four. Um, I don't know. That's the kind of thing that gets my heart beating. You know, a stock that's so beaten up, right? And if a stock has moved up, I'm like, shit, I missed it. Don't say that. Okay. Just maybe you did miss it, but just because a stock has moved up does not mean you've missed it or that it sh you shouldn't invest in it. It's absolutely irrelevant where a stock has been in the past. The only decision you need to make at any given time is, is I have the opportunity to buy JetBlue stock today at four. Is that a good price or not? That's the only thing that matters. doesn't matter whether it came from one to four or 26 to four. So here were my favorite stocks a year ago. Most of them are still my favorites today. Uh, Berkshire is a great foundation for any conservative portfolio. Companies kicking butt. But you're probably just going to match the S&P. You might do a point or two better per year than the S&P. So you know, just have reasonable expectations. Um, we think there's a long-term uh, secular, not cyclical bull market in energy. So we've got some ways to play that. We like Berkshire's Occidental Petroleum, Slamberger. Um, we think it's some of the commodities, tech resources, a copper play, deer is an um, um, agricultural play. Um, um, we, I've, I've owned the big banks, Goldman and Wells Fargo for years. Um, high quality tech, it's had a big run this year. I was pounding the table on it, particularly Meta slash Facebook. I wrote six consecutive daily. Uh, I write in investing daily. I wrote, I did something I've never done before. I dedicated six consecutive dailies to a super in-depth analysis of Meta last November 1st, that week, um, you know, when the stock was 95 bucks and, you know, tripled in six months. Everything I predicted and more came true. Uh, so um, forget biotech and cannabis on this list. Um, those were stupid mistakes last year. Um, so um, I also write in my dailies, we do not have a short selling product. I have not shorted a single stock since I closed my hedge fund in 2017, but I've, I regularly warn my readers against the absolute garbage that's out there. Um, this was my list a year ago, a dirty dozen that I put together back in 2022, which was based on a, what I called uh, my, my meme stock bubble basket, which was on January 26th of 2021, literally the day that GameStop hit $483, you know, split adjusted. Um, you know, I called the top on 25 stocks. I narrowed the list to 12 stocks a year ago. They were down 28% as of last August in the seven months um, that I labeled them. And you can go look at these stocks. Um, they're all down 50. I'd say they're probably, eh, they're probably down. They're probably down. Uh, eat, I just updated this off the top of my head. These stocks were already down 28%. They're down another 60% from here in the last uh, 14 months. So, um, so uh, happy to take questions at this point. Sorry, I ran a little long, but you know we've got 15 minutes or so. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. Uh, um, so for any of the attendees who want to uh, unmute, uh, raise the hands, uh, Francis can go ahead and uh, let you ask your questions. Uh, I think uh, I'll just kick it off with one question. Um, Winnie, uh, 
Charles, uh, Charlie basically wrote in the Wall Street Journal this weekend, uh, where he basically yeah. said, uh, you know, value invest effectively from the way I read it was that the traditional value investing approach is dead. Um, and had you picked, uh, you know, a few stocks that were way above average, uh, you would have basically, you know, that's the way to kind of look forward from here on out. Uh, you know, what I, what, you know, you also mentioned this in your, in your, in your presentation. Uh, so what are your thoughts around this? And, um, is value investing in its in its traditional Graham sense uh, considered dead at this point, at least for now? It depends how you define traditional value investing. Like the old, you know, cigar butt investing, you know, died long ago. Just running stock screens, you know, died back in the late '90s uh, or whatever. Um, Charlie did hit the main takeaway, and by the way, I covered uh, that uh, interview. Also, Munger did a podcast with. Hold on. Uh, let me let me tell you the name of it so you can look it up. It's it's well done. I, I recommend it co completely coincidentally. He did a podcast with these young guys um, and that podcast called Acquired. Um, so check it out. And it's uh, 67 minutes of just talking to Charlie. Uh, so it's it's well worth listening to. So I covered that in Monday's Daily. I covered the Wall Street Journal article uh, in yesterday's Daily. And by the way, I, um, if anyone wants to get my daily, we're actually currently transitioning and merging Empire Financial Research with another subsidiary of my parent company called Stansbury Research. So the only way to get on my uh, to receive my investing daily right now is you have to send me an email with the email addresses and I can send it to our customer service to add people because our website is undergoing transition. So. Um, if you're um, if you're interested in following, you know, I, I write my thoughts on the market, interesting stocks every once in a while, pound the table on something like Meta um, and and my dirty dozen stocks to avoid and stuff. Um, what's going on with inflation, et cetera. That's all in my investing daily. So anyone who's listening who wants to start receiving that, because um, I'm just um, just send me just compile it and send me an email and I'll add people. Um, so uh, to your question, what I've just been covering the last two days in my daily about, you know, what Charlie Munger's had to say is, is, you know, he pointed out just what I pointed out, which is, you know, the old approach of buying a basket of 50 statistically cheap stocks, the old Walter Schloss approach, which was Warren Buffett's approach from 1957 through the 60s and, uh, you know, until he closed his hedge fund, um, that stopped working a long time ago, um, it, you know. Um, instead, what I talked about is what Munger was highlighting as well is, is you got to find, you got to build a portfolio, but you got to find, you got to get lucky and slash smart, find a few big winners and then have the, the good sense to ride them, uh, and, and not get sold out. So, uh, Charlie was, um, you know, what I said was echoing what Charlie was saying, I think. Yep. Um, oh, and by the way. By the way, um, you mentioned in your introduction, but for Charlie's Almanac, which I'm one of the contributors to, I've even got my picture in the first few pages of all the contributors, um, is a fabulous book. And af after you finish studying Buffett, um, Munger should be the second person that you study. And and poor Charlie's Almanac is the best place to learn about Munger. Yep, yep, definitely. Uh, Francis, do you have any questions that have come through or anyone that's raised hands? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, okay. Um, so guys, please feel free, uh, to raise your hands, uh, and, uh, or just ask in the Q and A, but we want you to raise your hands and ask in person. All right. While people are working up the courage, I'll give a little pitch. I'm going to send you this book, the PDF, or do you already have it? I've already sent it to you. Kishan? When I came to your place, uh, you gave me a copy of it, but the PDF would be, would be great. Okay. I can send you a PDF, but look, um, this is straight from the mouth of Warren Buffett, the most, uh, of the five things that are, it affected my life the most, the five little quotes that have always stuck with me that have that w why I consider him and Munger such mentors and how they've changed my life. Um, one, one quote is, is um, he said, the two most important decisions you make in your life are who you marry and what career you pick. And he said, I don't even know what number three is. Stop and think about, you know, if you look at people who are happy or unhappy in their lives, um, you know, maybe number three is, is, you know, if you get unlucky with an illness or an accident, right, it can, can really screw things up. But so I wrote this book with that in mind. Um, chapter three is, um, so I, I channeled my inner Charlie Munger 
I focused the book uh, where he says invert, always invert. So instead of a book on how to be successful in life, it's a book on how to avoid the calamities that will ruin your life. Because my daughters have been, of course, incredibly fortunate to have two wonderful parents and to be brought up in a in a loving and you know materially comfortable environment. Um, and so there, they've no children could have ever had as good a start in life. So now the main their main objective in life should be not to screw it up. Um, and so this book is focused on the five ways that I have observed that people screw up their lives. Uh, and one of them is they marry the wrong person. Uh, so there's a chapter in there. It has the 12 questions to ask before you marry someone. And uh, I got lucky. I didn't have those questions, but got lucky. And my wife and I just celebrated our 30th anniversary a month ago. Um, but I've, gosh, I've seen now at age 57, like the last five, 10 years, uh, I've seen so many of my friends and family's lives absolutely overturned, just wrecked uh, by their marriages falling apart. Uh, and so um, both finding the right person, uh, picking the right person, and then paying close attention to your marriage so that it doesn't fall apart. Um, all, I'd say one third of the divorces I've seen um, have been they made a mistake going in. They just married the wrong person. Um, but two thirds of the time, they married a great person and they had a happy marriage. And then over five, 10, 15 years, it went bad slowly. Uh, and you got to be super conscious of that. So that's the chapter. If, if you don't have time to read the whole 200 pages, read the 13 pages or 15 pages of that chapter. Um, it's um, it's the best advice I can give to a young person. No, I, I read the book and definitely, uh, definitely loved it. Uh, I think we have a question from Oriana, right? Oriana, do you want to go ahead? Hello. Uh, thank you for coming to speak. Uh, I was wondering, so you said some of your like best insights came from actually talking to the companies and talking to people. But starting out, you know, especially in college and before we get our first jobs, we don't have that kind of connections with like the world yet. Is talking to companies as straightforward as just kind of like sending a LinkedIn message or an email and being like, hey, I'd like to talk about your company or your like sector as a whole, or are there better strategies to like finding those insights and finding those people? Yeah, um, you'd be surprised um, uh, uh, how if you're a student, you're a young person, and if you write a well-crafted uh, email or something, like directly to the CEO or somebody or look up your alumni directory, lots of MIT alums at lots of companies and all kind of thing. You'd be surprised how many people take a phone call or, uh, you know, will meet with you or something because everyone's got a soft spot for students, right? So in some ways you got it easier than me, right? Um, so obviously it helps to have a Rolodex over time, et cetera. But um, but um, I find uh, showing up at conferences, if there's somebody I'm a big fan of, maybe want to get a job with somebody uh, at a particular company, or if I want to get a job at, um, at a hedge fund or something, you know, find out where the charity event, where that person's being honored. Um, you know, it helps to be in New York, of course, this is a high concentration, but, um, you know, there are ways to, uh, if you're, if you're clever, and uh, and you do a Google alert for the name of somebody who you really admire and stuff, and and you see that they were quoted in the newspaper, um, or you know, um, you know the way I sort of developed a relationship with Buffett is is you know I became a disciple, a follower. I transcribed his meetings. Uh, I uh, I trans. How did I get to know Munger? I transcribed all of his speeches. I was the first person to do that. Um, as Kishan mentioned um, in the opening. I collected Warren Buffett's old partnership letters from his old LPs, not from him. And I compiled them and I transcribed them and OCR'd them into a Word file so that they could be shared. So when Al Schroeder was writing a biography of Buffett, you know, and asked, oh, can I get a copy of your old partnership letters? He laughed and he said, ask Whitney, he has a more complete copy than I do. That's that's a way to get noticed uh, and make an impression and get access. So yeah, once or twice, once or once every year or two, that I need some advice from Buffett or whatever, and I pick up the phone, he'll he'll pick up the phone and talk to me. Or if I shoot an email, he'll reply through his secretary. He doesn't he doesn't have his own email. So those are just those are some advice. You you got to be bold, creative, clever, um, and persistent, but not don't be a stalker. <laughs> Thank you. We've got a, one question that came in through the chat. Um, it's a question about 
the opportunities in the in the developing world. The question is, what is your take strategy on investing not just in America but around the globe? Yeah, um, I cannot see um, any of the participants, uh, your names or your faces, but I'm assuming you're quite an international group. Um, that's certainly what I've observed at other MBA programs. Um, and my suggestion to you is, is if you are from another country, speak another language, et cetera, um, focus, try to really develop expertise there. Um, first of all, you want to focus and develop expertise in something you're genuinely interested in, right? And somewhere where you might have an edge. Um, and so I can't invest in India. I can't invest in China. I can't invest in Kenya. I don't speak the language. I don't know the local norms. I don't have any connections. Um, so I stick to unfortunately, the most picked over market in the world. Um, so if you have expertise elsewhere, um, uh, and uh, then I would suggest become the world expert on your home country or region um, as, as certainly one area. Um, if now, I, you know, I talked to one guy who's from Israel and uh, he was just running, you know, buying Berkshire Hathaway and all. And I said, that's really dumb. Go become an expert on Israel if you're running a $5 million hedge fund. Um, this was, you know, 15 years ago. He didn't take my advice and he failed because there he's sitting there in Tel Aviv and he's buying Berkshire Hathaway with a hedge fund. Like if I'm an investor, why would I give him any money to invest in some U.S. company um, that makes and, and a large cap, you know, mega cap as well, um, you know, finding uh, so developing sort of deep expertise in an area where ideally you have some background and you have genuine interest, ideally passion for it, um, whether it's biotech, medical devices, I, I don't suggest some idiotic like crypto, right? I mean, geez, if there's anything large scale dumber than crypto, I do not know what it is. Um, but the, you're talking to a 57 year old value guy, okay? I'm just telling you, don't, don't do something stupid, become an expert in something that's gonna be around in a while, um, not just rank speculation, where there's actually some analysis to be done. Other questions? We probably have time for one or two more. Yeah, Leonardo, go ahead. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Winnie. I'm my name is Bill, and we actually met once, one, 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 once in 2010 at the Berkshire Hathaway meeting. Nice. So my question today is: In your favorite and the least favorite stock list, uh, I don't see any name related to AI, either Nvidia or Sense semi or any AI related names. I yeah. wonder, wonder what's the, the kind of, what's your view on that? Yeah, um, I totally miss this uh, sort of. If you actually go back and look at my analysis of Meta back in November of last year, they were investing heavily in AI to compete with TikTok, for example, with their reels. And that's been very successful. Google is one of the main beneficiaries of AI for a variety of ways. And that's been one of my recommendations as well. Um, so I, I have tapped into it. Um, and by the way, um, NVIDIA was one of five stocks we recommended back. Um, it wasn't an AI play. Um, back in February of 2020, right before the COVID crash, um, we did a big hour long, almost like 60 minutes report on um, autonomous and electric vehicles. Um, stupidly should have had Tesla in there, but we did have NVIDIA in there and that's up like seven X since then. Um, and so, you know, NVIDIA turned into, uh, they were, our thesis was they were making the chips for electric and autonomous vehicles. Um, it turned out, this is the kind of story where when you have, when you get really lucky on a stock, you better hold on, right? We didn't anticipate the AI, you know, the the AVEV played out just as we hoped, and the stock was a double or a triple based on that. And then it caught the next AI wave that we had no knowledge of, you know, back then. So um, my concern is, is that by the time everybody and their grandmother is talking about AI, it's largely priced into the stocks. And then, of course, you have all the second and third tier Me Too players and all the stupid IPOs and SPACs of garbage companies trying to ride the coattail of a, of a legitimate boom, right? So um, I would just, um, I would just say, say sort of be careful investing in hot sectors. And um, usually hot sectors, you know, there's some sort of, you know, they can bust just as hard as they bubble. Uh, so um, but look, I'm trying to, you know, I feel a little pressure because I'm in the investment newsletter business. And the only thing selling this year is the AI promos because individual investors are very excited about AI. 
So, you know, I'm sort of working with one of my analysts um, who I'll give you a little a little tip. He is actually pitched. He thinks that um, built into glasses will be sort of AI and stuff. And everyone's laughing at Google glasses and what a joke that is. And that it was sort of a joke, but every a lot of people laughed at early versions of a lot of things um, before they became popular. But he thinks sort of AI is going to be integrated into an interface where will will be interacting you know using something like glasses that we're wearing as opposed to through our phones um uh you know one big cap way to play it is is through google which is making a big investment in this space you know alphabet but um but you know we're doing active thinking about, about this thank you uh Whitney, we have a uh... Three more questions are you good to go for a few more minutes or how's your schedule yes um i'll answer them quickly okay so Karthik, uh, uh, maybe we can unmute Karthik and then Ethan. Hello. Hi. Hey, Whitney. Uh, thanks for thanks for giving the talk today. Uh, my question was about tech. So a lot of us in the undergrad population are pretty tech savvy. Are there any ways you think tech could be used to improve the investment process at a value based hedge fund? I know a lot of people use products like CapIQ or AlphaSense or Tegas. How do I answer this question succinctly? Because I mean, look, tech in general, like when I started investing back in 1999, like it was a competitive edge to be able to come up with a good investment idea and then to go actually find the printed annual reports and stuff. So just generally tech, like all the world's information is available at your fingertips has fundamentally changed investing, made it much more competitive um, and old sources of advantage just completely disappeared, like access to court filings or just or just SEC filings, annual reports, 10Ks and Qs uh, coming up with lots of investment ideas. We now have the opposite problem. We're all drowning in ideas. Um, now, look, another way to answer this question is, is that the hottest hedge funds out there are the quant funds. They've incorporated tech. Um, you know, the Citadels and whatever. Um, and um, Jim Simon's uh, Renaissance Technology has probably been the best performing fund of all time, um, purely quantitative. So tech, supercomputers and a thousand PhDs at Two Sigma and all doing something I just do not understand. Right. Uh, but um, so, you know, the question is, is, you know, how do you apply it to what Bill Ackman does or what I do or what David Einhorn does or what Seth Klarman does? I mean, the tech is useful. I use Capital IQ. Most I don't even know how to use a Bloomberg, but other people prefer Bloomberg. But it's it's very it makes it much more efficient for me to do a deep fundamental dive on just a company's numbers, et cetera, et cetera. Then at that point, I need to start looking for an edge. Um, can I go visit stores? Can I talk to management? Do I know any other? Do I know someone who's a ten percent shareholder or at least a five percent shareholder in the company uh, who I can piggyback on their analysts, et cetera? There's no tech. There's very little tech involved in that. Um, you know, my my suggestion is is you all being MIT, if you have a tech background and all, and you're really passionate about software as a service or semiconductors or artificial intelligence or something, you might be able to develop an edge and use that MIT network and the training, the background you have, if you have an undergrad degree in computer science, you know, whatever, to develop some expertise where you can apply value investing in a tech vertical. Um, the tech sector, you know, has a lot of growth, tends to have, you know, very high margins, et cetera. Um, and it tends to have bubbles and busts in the stock market, which is great for a value investor in that you you can you have the courage to buy at the bust and then you don't make double your money on the way out. You make 10 percent of your money and sell at the top of the bubble. So bubbles and busts by other investors are very good for for you as long as you don't participate as long as you're the contrarian and don't you know look to signals from the market uh second question thank you yeah ethan i think go ahead ethan you're muted Thank you, Whitney, uh, for refreshing the uh, principles uh, as a the value investor, what kind of principles we should uh, uh, stick to, uh, especially in a time of very difficult times. So recently, my 
personal investment performance wasn't that good because of, mostly because of the uh, changes in market sentiment and the uh, uh, market situation. So my first question to you is about uh, how do you respond when to the changes in the uh, macroeconomic situation, like the, when the interest rate goes up, the, many people just uh, want to move to the uh, uh, safer place like uh, bond investing instead yeah. of the uh, stock investing. So some of my friends made some uh, fortune out of the uh, bond investing, but I still stick with the uh, uh, stock investing. So, but I, my performance is that good. So I wonder how did you respond to manage your yeah. portfolio? Well, um, I'll say, um, I'm going to guess you're from China. No, I'm from South Korea. Oh, South Korea. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, and I have been to South Korea and I once owned a couple South Korean companies. I was, I was, uh, you know, incredibly impressive country, um, and some really great businesses there. Um, but, um, I will say when you're investing in markets like South Korea, China, um, uh, you know, any, I would say emerging markets, uh, less well-developed markets, the macro tends to matter a lot more. Um, so you better be paying close attention to, you know, if Xi Jinping doesn't like the um, Jack Ma of Alibaba, he's going to crush that stock, right? So there's sort of macroeconomic and then there's com company specific. Um uh, so the answer might be different there. Um, I would say um, in the United States and, and in Europe and all, trying to figure out, you know, interest rates and inflation and blah, 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 what the Fed's going to do next. I don't spend an awful lot of time on it. I do once every five or 10 years get a very strong feeling about a bubble or a bust. And I have a very good long term track record of very publicly calling the top of the internet bubble, the bottom of the internet bus, the top of the housing bubble, the bottom of the housing bubble, the top. I, I did not call the top of the COVID thing. I did not see that 30% decline, 35% decline coming in six weeks, but I nailed the bottom like to the hour. Um, so, but other than that, you should just ignore it and just focus on, uh, on individual companies. And I do tend to be drawn towards sectors or companies um, that are really um, uh, beaten up, like the whole airline sector. By the way, the whole SPAC sector was 90, 90 plus percent garbage. But my parent company, MarketWise, is a SPAC um, that the original founder of the company just came back a couple of weeks ago. And I'm not allowed to talk about it in my newsletters for conflict of interest reasons. But if you ask me to name one stock that could be a 10 bagger, uh, or at least a five bagger, a five bagger in three years, 10 bagger in five years. Um, I could, in a fairly picked over market, Munger is correct. You know, valuations, you know, are generally pretty high. Where can you find cheap stuff? You know, try and find the needle in the haystack, the baby stone out with the bathwater in the most hated sectors. Um, cannabis is absolutely hated, but I'm not sure I can find anything there. I was absolutely wrong to be trying to bottom fish in cannabis, but um, the SPAC sector is equally hated. Um, you know, my parent company has gone from 10 to 10 to a dollar 30 and is now at two bucks with a new CEO in who has a pretty damn impressive long-term record in the investment newsletter business. So, um, so, um, you know, um, ignore the macro and try and find areas like I now have expertise in the investment newsletter business, my own parent company. Uh, that owns 80% of my company uh, is is a horribly out of favor stock in a horribly out of favor sector, right? That's the kind of that's the kind of thing you should be looking for. Um, last question before I have to run to dinner. Yes, um, <clears throat> this came Trent, from an anonymous attendee. Mm -hmm. uh -oh, if, tough question. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. you've called AI an 87 trillion dollar opportunity. How do you fence overvalue overvaluation, wrong timing, and bad impact to sustainability? Hmm. I think that may be one of our promos or something, and the marketing people got a little excited. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I do think AI is huge, but I um, I'm struggling to find you know companies that haven't already like the smaller companies that have gotten hot, you know, or up a ton. So I've sort of stuck to. I still think Meta. I still think if you if you right now told me. Um, uh, for the next, I had to build a 10 year portfolio, um, and that I could just forget about for 10 years, I would put 50% of Berkshire Hathaway and split the remaining 50% between Amazon meta and alphabet. And then I'd forget about it for 10 years. 
it's not going to be a 10 bagger, uh, but I think it'll do better than the S&P 500. Um, and uh, so, and I think those tech stocks, those three tech stocks I named, and you could throw Microsoft in that mix as well. Um, that's, that's really made an investment in AI. Um, that's all I can say about AI. It's, it's, a, it's a big, exciting area, um, but I'm sticking to the, I'm sort of being a chicken, sticking to the big cap stuff and hoping for a nice big old bust when I can buy some of the smaller companies, um, you know, after they've dropped by 80%. So with that, um, thank you. You've been great, good, great questions. Um, and, um, uh, Kishan, I've already sent you a copy of this slide presentation, so you're welcome to share this. And um, I will right now, the moment I hang up this call, I'll just send you a PDF of uh, of um, the art of playing defense. And um, um, you're welcome to share it with the students and any students who want to receive my investing daily. Um, um, I assume you receive it, Kishan, um, so you can just forward it to the group so people know, like they can see what today's daily was or yesterday's or something. So feel free to share it. And anyone who wants to be on the list, you're going to have to email me. You know, don't send me 20 emails. Send me one email with 20 names or five names or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Whitney, thank you so much. This has been amazing. It's been yeah. an incredible opportunity. My pleasure. Uh, and by the way, if you post this, send me the link for sure. I'll link to it. Um, definitely. Sh share this as you wish. Most definitely. Thank you so much, Whitney. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Whitney. Have a good evening.